from me. And in with he did it all, my sister sees up. It's time to sit back, relax, and let's have a good time, relax. Well, it's time to sit back, relax, and let's have a good time. Well, it's all right. Said it's all right. Well, it's all right to have a good time. It's all right. Whoa, oh, it's all right. Everybody clap your hands. Come on and give yourself a chance. And if you got the Lord and everybody knows that it's all right. Whoa, it's all whoa. And when I wake up, Early in the morning, and I'm down on my knees in prayer. I want to know how can you just sit there knowing God's blessed you and he gave you this moment today. Well, I said it's all right. Uh-huh. Say it's all right to have a good time. Saying it's all right. Oh, it's all right. Everybody else, pat your feet. Just paddle now to the beat. Let us know that you've got the Lord. And everybody knows that it's all right. Oh, it's all right. Oh, and when I wake up early in the morning, down on my knees in prayer. Want to know how can you just sit there knowing God's blessed you when he gave you this moment today? It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Mm -hmm. I said it's all right to have a good time. Saying it's all right. Whoa, it's all. Whoa, I said it's all right. To have a good time, sing it sorry. Whoa, it's all. Whoa, I said it's all right. Brothers and sisters, before uh, before we sing this selection, I just wanted to share. Uh, the last, the, the first time, which is the only time we sang this song, was during the uh, graduates program. And during that program, afterwards, uh, Sister Tammy Washington came up to me and she said, uh, Brother Allen, she said, that's my song. Y'all sung my song. She said, I cried from when you started to when it ended. And I said that because uh, before Sister Tammy left last week, I told her, I said, now, when you get back, uh, we're going to sing this song for you. Even if we have to come to the house while you're recovering, we're going to come sing it. And I said, and after that, as the Lord bless you to get back on your feet, we want you to come sing it. Come yeah. sing with us. Right. And so I said that because I want us to, to all our songs are unto the Lord. Yes, but for, for this selection among us, uh, we want to dedicate this selection to Sister Tammy Washington. And we want to continue to keep her in prayer as God brings her Amen. to her full measure of health to her recovery. I'm so glad you died for me. I'm so glad you shed your blood for me. I'm so glad you rose for me. So glad, Lord, you died 
Yeah. 
Okay, brothers and sisters, we, we reach a, we're reaching way back now. <laughs> Going back to the vaults to get one. We had rehearsal Thursday night. We went over it one time. It went pretty good, so we feel like we can share it with the congregation. So y'all pray for Sister Gisette and the rest of them. Since Brother Larry stated in the sermon, I figured right. the Holy Spirit was working yeah. at all of us. Yeah. He did it all, he did it all and I know it was all, all for me, me, and he did it all, he yeah, did it all and I know it was all, all for me. my responses, my responses, thank him for giving all I need, I need. oh, he did it all, he did it all and it was for, for me. me, and he did it all, he did it all, and I know it was for me, and he did it all, yeah, and I know it was all for my responses, thank him for giving all I need, oh, he did it all, and it was for me, I gotta tell you that he did it all, it was back on Calvary, and that's why I believe divine destiny my response is thank him for giving all i need oh he did it all and it was for me and he did it all and i know it was all for me and he did it all yeah i believe it was all for my responses, oh, my responses, thank him for giving all I need. Oh, he did it all, and it was for me. I gotta tell you that he did it all, and I thank him in advance. While all of the folks are dead and gone, I still have a chance. My response is thank him for giving all I need. Oh, he did it all, and it was for me, and he did it all, and I know it was all for me, and he did it all, yeah, and I know it was all for my responses, thank him for giving all I need, oh, he did it all, yes, he did it all, well, he did it all, yeah, and it was for me, come on, tell him, thank you. One more time to thank him. Thank you, Lord, for all you done for me. Oh, come on, let's tell him you did it. You did it well, I know you did it. Oh, yes, yes, you did it all. Hey, you did it well, I know you did it. Oh, yes, yes, you did it all. You did it for me one Sunday night. Hey, I don't know about a fear. I promise you will fight now. Oh, come on, let's tell him. Thank you. Three more times to thank him. Thank you, Lord, for all you done for me. A two more time to thank him. Thank you, Lord, for all you done for me. A one more time to thank him. Thank you. Lord, for all you done for me. A part of you, let's.
just Ten tell him you did it. You did, you did, you did it. it. Well, I know you did it. You did oh, yes, yes, you did it all. Hey, you did it. Well, I know you did it. Oh, yes, yes, you did it all. You did it for me one Sunday night. Hey, I don't know about a fear. Promise you will fight now. Come on, let's tell him. Three more times to thank him. Thank you, Lord, for all you died for me. Two more times to thank him. Thank you, Lord, for all you died for me. One last time to thank him. Come on, let's tell him you did it. You did, uh, you did yes, it. it. Well, I know you did it. You did. Oh, yes, yes, you did it all. Hey, you did yes, it. Well, I know you did it. Oh, yes, yes, you did it all. You did it for me one Sunday night. Hey, I don't know about a fear. Promise you will fight now. Come on, let's tell him. Thank you, Lord. Oh, you fight on, you fight on and on, and you fight on, and you fight on. Oh, and keep your hands in God's hands, and you fight on, oh, and you fight on. Well, and if your brother treats you wrong, you ought to take it to your brother and God alone. Oh, and you say, brother, treated me wrong, and you fight on, oh, and you fight on, well, and you fight on, you fight on and on, and you fight on, and you fight on, oh, and keep your hands in God's hands, and you fight on, oh, and you fight on, cause it's in my Lord, it's in my veins, it's in my veins, Lord, it's in my veins, Lord, and while the blood is running warm, it's in my veins, oh Lord, it's in my well, and I'm gonna shout just a little over here, I'm gonna shout just a little over there, Lord, and while the blood is running warm, it's in my veins, oh Lord, it's in my well, I know it's in my Lord, it's in my veins, it's in my veins, it's in my veins, Lord, and while the blood running warm, it's in my veins, oh Lord, it's in my veins, and I've got peace, peace of mind, and I've got that joy that I never could find. Well, and I've got that love at last, and it cannot be surpassed. I've even got the brightest star that shines, cause I've got heaven on my mind. Mm, I got Jesus, and I know, and I know he's mine. Oh. Yes, I know that he's mine. I know that Jesus is mine. He's a friend so dear. He's a friend and he lives in me, Jesus. He lives all along. He's ever near. He's ever mm -hmm, 10,000 wonderful times.
shine all around, all around me shine. Most of all, most of all, I know that he is mine. Well, and yes, I know that he's mine. I know. And Jesus is mine, and he's a friend so dear. He's a friend, and he lives in me, Jesus. He lives all alone, and he's ever near. He's ever mm, 10,000 wonderful times all around. Well, and most of all, most of all, I know that he's mine, no, mine. And most of all, most of all, I know that he's mine, oh, mine. And most of all, most of all, I know that he's mine, oh, mine. Amen. Good afternoon. We are so deeply indebted to the God of heaven for this opportunity that, that we share together on this afternoon. We realize, and I certainly uh, realize, that uh, this is a change and a difference within the framework of, of our normal venue. Inasmuch as during the month of July, in the normal course of things, uh, we would have invested time, energy, and funding to have a visiting minister of the gospel uh, with us on this day. Earlier in the year, as leadership continued to realize that the, the evangelizing of this community uh, rests squarely on the shoulders of this family, uh, that one of the things that we wanted to do was uh, become both comfortable with our brethren who are preaching brethren, which is why in April we had an in-house meeting with our brethren within the family during the preaching. And then uh, this summer for the first time, uh, sharing in what we pray will be an annual summer series uh, that's preached by the local preacher here uh, as we reach out to our community because the labor of getting the job done belongs to us. I want to say to the family here at Parkview Drive that I am indebted. You have truly encouraged me on this day. I thank our Ministry of Food Service and Benevolence uh, for putting in the toil and sweat and preparing such a wonderful meal for all of us today. We appreciate so very much our gifted singers, Redemption, for blessing and lifting our hearts. And girls, I did get by without tears today. It was hard, but, but, but it worked out okay. And, and I want to give thanks to uh, our visiting family members uh, that are with us to encourage us. Uh, if, if there was not the same event happening, in Fountain Hill, all those Arkansas guys would be here as well. But we're going we're to get all things worked out so that uh, we can flow and be able uh, to truly uh, be there to encourage one another. Amen. On this evening, I also want to share with our family, many of you have, have been loving, patient, and open enough to have listened to my preaching for some 35 years. And, and you're still willing to sit and hear the word of God. Amen. And we thank God for that. Amen. I want you to know also that realizing that, 
that nothing that you were here today nor during the week is any leftovers. There are no leftovers that you will be hearing. There are no lessons that have been warmed up for this particular occasion. All that you are here, all that you were here is fresh from the Holy Ghost. Uh, so, so, so there has been labor. And I trust and pray that, that you will be able to know, thank you, Brother Ricky, and, and understand uh, that this is a very serious matter and not something that we are doing to pass the time. Finally, before we enter into our discussion for this afternoon, I want to say that we have received some additional news from Houston. The last news that I received was that it's a possibility that the Washingtons might be home as early as tomorrow. As early as tomorrow. Uh, which simply means that God, God, we, we see his timetable. And, and he's moving faster than our humanity anticipated. But that's the kind of God that we serve. And I want us this, eve, this afternoon to, as we share the lesson, the Lord, he is God. We want to understand very vividly and pray for us as we do this. We want to understand and leave here today realizing, never doubting at all in the sovereignty of God over the salvation of of men, the sovereignty of God over the salvation of men. As we come together this evening, we, we realize that humanity, the religious world, and yes, even the church of Christ and all of its members. Girls, would you please slow down and listen. Get, get some of this. Don't, don't come out here today and leave here with nothing. God bless you. When, when we look at this, that, that all of us that I just mentioned, we, we need to know who's in charge. That, that's what this is about. The religious world needs to know that, that, that high-powered and high-paid men are not in charge. Organizations and, and schemes and gimmicks are, are not in charge. The eldership ain't in charge. The preachers and evangelists are not in charge. We must understand who is in charge. And, and we ask the question then, outside of the assembly, who's in charge of our lives? Who's making the decisions at home? Who's our counselor from day to day? Who is in charge of our leader? of our leisure time, who's in charge of, of the church business, the meetings and the ministries? Who's in charge of the decisions that we make about our relationship to God and to our fellow man? If we don't have our Godness right, the major part, if not all, of those decisions are made by us. And it is because of that, that that we live in a world that is full of religious confusion. There is religious chaos on every hand. People all around us are deceived. They are blinded, willfully ignorant of God's will for human salvation. And because of that, people are lost and they are dying lost every day. In this short series of lessons, we want to pause and remind ourselves and, and the world and anybody who would listen that the book stops with God, that we need to recognize who God is. God sets the standard for all things. And the only human requirement is simply to obey God. God is indeed man's only hope. And we must obey his will. I want to lay before you, as I did this morning, and I'll do it with every lesson, three propositions. 
three propositions that I believe with all of my heart that no man will be able to stand surely with the word of God and even begin to refute because everything that we teach and every proposition comes from God. It does not come from man. Proposition number one is that the sovereign Lord of heaven set his irrevocable plan of salvation in place before the world began. Before God created Adam, it was already done. It was already over. There's no newness under the sun concerning a, a man's ability before God to reach his grace. Secondarily, because of his sovereign plan, human religion is void in its ability to change the sin destiny of all mankind. Human religion is powerless to help humanity receive forgiveness of even a single sin. Human religion is void of that. And finally, in number three, we want to understand that the sovereign Lord has ordained that all salvation is according to Christ, the gospel of Christ, the church of Christ and uh, the doctrine uh, of Christ. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. On to this evening, before everybody fall asleep, turn quickly. <laughs> turn quickly. Turn right now to Isaiah 46. <laughs> turn hurriedly to Isaiah 46. We got to get one of these points before we leave this place, right? We got to get one. In Isaiah 46, we find that the God of heaven comes to his people. And God is saying, let me reintroduce myself. God, God is saying, for some reason, my people don't understand what it means for me to be God. My, my, my people don't, don't understand. They, they are missing the mark. God says, Isaiah, will you please reintroduce me to my people? Reintroduce my people to the God of heaven so that they will understand who I am. And it is only when we understand who God is that we can begin to understand either who we are or who we ought to be. And so, and so, and so when we, when we see this in Isaiah 46, Isaiah says, he says in verse 3, and, and verse, verse 3 down through about verse 8 uh, uh, lays out the preliminary, and then we get into the meat uh, uh, in, 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 in verse 9. He says here, listen to me, you descendants of Jacob, all the remnant of the people of Israel. You whom I have upheld since your birth. Do, do we have anybody in the house today that has existed one day in your life when God did not hold you up? You see, you see all of us fit right there in the category. I, I, every day of my life, I look back and I know that my God was there. So I know he hits me right there. You whom I have upheld since your birth and have carried since you were born, even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you. I will carry you. I will sustain you. I will rescue you. That's, that's my Lord. That, 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 that's the God that we call on. Now watch him now. He says, with whom will you compare me? Account me equal. To whom will you liken me that we may be compared? He said, some pour out gold from their bags and weigh out silver on the scales. They hire a goldsmith to make it into a God, and they bow down and worship it. We go, we go down to the dealership. 
and we sign on the dotted line for 72 months, driving off the floor, and it begins to eat up and take up all of our time. We spend all of our time making it pretty and shiny, and the man in the mirror is looking all worn, dusty, and on its way out. He said, he said, they lift it to their shoulders and carry it. They set it up in place, and there it stands. From that spot, God says, it can't move. Even though someone cries out to it, it cannot answer. It cannot save them uh, from their troubles. Uh, men, men have put together religion. They have put together mechanism. They have put together doctrines. Men have put together everything. But that stuff cannot save. God was talking about his people and their idolatry. So you go out there and cut a tree down and make you a God. Polish it up. And the, the, the God, your God can't move unless you move it. Your God, you got to take care of your God. God said, that's not me. He said, don't, don't bring me down to the gods of humanity. That's not me. He's saying, church of Christ, don't bring me down to the God of this world. We've got to know who God is. Watch what he says. He says, let me reintroduce myself to my own people. God said in verse 8, remember this. Keep it in mind. Take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. Now, God said, let me break it down. He says, I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. He said, let me tell you something about me. He says, I make known the end from the beginning. Did anybody hear that? From ancient times, what is still to come. He says, I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. From the east, I summon a bird of prey. From a far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. God says, that, that, that makes me God. Listen to me, you stubborn hearted. You who are now far from my righteousness, I'm bringing my righteousness near. It is not far away and my salvation will not be delayed. I will grant salvation to Zion. My splendor to Israel. God, God said, let me reintroduce myself. That, that, that we, we've got to understand the God that we serve. In Isaiah 46, 9, God says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. So you see, part of the issue here, part of the issue in the text is the uniqueness and the sovereignty of God among all of the beings uh, of the universe. God says, my children need to understand that there's nothing you can see, you can touch, you can hear, you can feel, nothing that you can even imagine that you can compare to me. The book stops with me. I'm all that and some more. Jesus says, says, I said that he is in a class all by himself. He said there's nothing or no one like me. You see, the issue is, what does it mean to be God? You see, when something happens or something is, is being said or thought, and God responds by saying, I am God, what, what we're saying is that I'm trying to get you to the point because you're acting like you don't know what it means for me to be God. When we struggle with our prayer life, when we struggle with faithfulness, when we have scared of the gospel, 
and, and we're concerned about the religions of the world, uh, God is saying you're acting like you don't know who I am. You're acting like you don't know what it means for me to be God. And so, and so he, he, gives us, he gives us some help here. In, 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 getting, in getting that done because, you see, you see we, we want to understand. And, and when we understand this, it will, it will help to change the very flow of our lives because, because we're going to see God in a way that we might not have seen him before as we look at this. So as we look at this, uh, God tells them what is at the heart of his godness. And, and then when we get into verse 10, he begins to lay out what it means uh, for him uh, to be God. And this is what he says. He says, I declare the end from uh, the beginning. And from ancient times, uh, he, says, he says, things not yet done. And so there is a term, and I mentioned this one, we would share a few. There is a term in the scripture called, that Paul uses, it, the term is foreknowledge. For knowledge, uh, it simply says that again. Uh, what with the Bible? God, the Bible said God knows the end. What from the beginning? That that that's called for knowledge. Okay. Now now we said this that 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 this lesson today is about the sovereignty of God as it relates to salvation. That means that God is is all powerful. Nothing moves unless He says it it, it moves. Uh, nothing can stop God from doing what he's going to do, you see? And that, 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 that's why this stuff is so outlandish, you see? Uh, they, 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 this, this is why some of the isms out there is so outlandish. It's because people don't know God, see? If we know God, we know there was never a need for this because this was perfect from the beginning, you see, if we know God. And so, and so what, what we're trying to do in the next few lessons is to put the ax at the root of the tree. Uh, it's, it's, so we can stop cutting off limbs uh, and just lay the axe where it is and let people to understand that, that this just needs to be axed out. It's, already, it's never existed as far as God is concerned. Its only existence and importance is uh, in the lives of men who don't know God. Now, 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 when we look at this, this is what, notice that this is what, 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 the, what the Lord is, wants us to understand. He says in verse 10, I declare from ancient times, things not yet done. I know, uh, and, and, and so, but, but what we want to understand is that, is that be, it, it is because of God's sovereignty that, 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 that his foreknowledge is, is, is the way it is. And I'm going to explain it this way. When we look at the, the latter part of verse 10, the, latter, the second part of verse 10, God says, I declare... The end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things not yet done, this last part now, saying, my counsel shall what? Shall stand, and I will what? Accomplish all my purpose. Now, now, now get this. You see, when God speaks over here about an event that's going to happen over yonder, he doesn't speak it simply because he is aware that that is going to take place. He speaks it because he makes it take place. He speaks it because, because, uh, uh, because of his divine power, he causes it to happen. You see, that makes him God. You see, we can't do that. We can't do that. When many of us are planning vacation, all we can do is plan the vacation. You see, you see, we, we can talk about the vacation. We can talk about where we're going, what we're going to do. We can talk a good game, but we cannot perform one part of the game. Uh, the God of heaven has to check it off and give us the okay. I uh, guess what? It ain't happening. But you see, but you see, but you see, that's the difference between us and God. You see, God speaks something over here a thousand years before it happens because God has already decided that it's, he's going to make it happen. That, 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 that's, what, that, that, that's what makes him God. 
You see, you see, we got to understand that, that that is the God that we serve. You see, brothers and sisters, the future is nothing more than the counsel of God being established based on time. That's all that is. When God speaks of an event, the future is the purpose of God being accomplished by God. That's what, that's what Isaiah wants the people of God, and God wants us to understand. In other words, we want to understand that the reason, that the reason that, 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 that God's, God is able to predict an event that's going to come, uh, come to pass, the reason that it happens is that it's, it's a part of his purpose. And you see, only God can do that. When the Lord spoke through the prophets, we called it prophecy. But in actuality, prophecy was nothing more than the Lord revealing his counsel and purpose through his men. That's why humanity get all mixed up with prophecy. We pull in prophecy out of our imagination. Because God ain't giving no man anything. That's over. Peter said that men of God, that the prophets were men of God who spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Those men didn't even understand what they were saying themselves. But the Spirit of God spoke through them. That was God speaking. The, the prophets in the Old Testament were nothing more than mouthpieces for God where God put in them his purpose so when it happened, men would understand that God did that. That's what it's all about. And, and, and when we understand that and, we, re, 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 and we, we bring that over into the age of Christianity, into the age of the church, we begin to understand uh, that this stuff right here, it will never, never mount to anything. People are dying in this. No, don't, don't have to try to pick the stuff apart. Just put the axe at the root of the tree. When we look at that, to give us an example, in Genesis 3.15, we find this statement of God. God. God spoke this himself. He didn't give this to anybody. Wasn't nobody around to give it to. He had to speak this himself. In Genesis 3.15, the Bible says, uh, so, uh, 14 and 15, so the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. You ever seen a snake not crawling on his belly and not eating dust? Anybody saw a snake walking through the neighborhood lately? You don't see a snake walking anyway. He started walking. He started walking. He walked until God put him on his belly. And that that's where you're going to have to stay. Then he says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. You will strike his heel. That's what God told him. God told him that, that one is coming, not of the seed of man and woman, but of the seed of woman. And this one that's going to come is going to deal you the death blow. And we all know that that was none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Go with me to Galatians 4, then we'll make a statement. Go with me to Galatians 4. In Galatians 4, the Bible, and I love the way the Holy Ghost did this. In Galatians 4, starting in verse number 1, the, uh, Paul said to the church of Galatia in this fulfillment, he says, what I say, he says, what I'm saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set for his father. And he said, so also, when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental or spiritual forces of the world. Watch verse 4. But when the time, well, but when the set time had fully come. Now watch what he said. He says, but when the set time had fully come. When God spoke what he spoke in Genesis 3.15, he already had the time. Already set. Humanity just had to what? Get to the time. Because the time was already set. He said, he said, he said now, he said now, now in, in, in looking at this, but when the time set had fully come, God sent 
his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. When God spoke the word in Genesis 3.15, from that time until the time that is spoken of the coming of Christ, it was 4,100 years. 4,100 years. Only God can do that. That's the God that we serve. And all I'm saying today to the church is that if our God can speak 4,100 years of the coming of Christ, he can stand in that same spot and speak of the, of the day that the, the church would be given birth, the day that the gospel power would be loosed the day that the family of God would be originated on the planet earth and he didn't ask anybody for any help. He didn't ask anybody for any, uh, any permission because God is God all by himself. We must tell the world that God is God all by himself. When he spoke in Daniel uh, 2.44, uh, when he gave the prophecy, since that's what we got to deal with this week, when he gave the prophecy of the church, when he gave the prophecy in Daniel about the fact that God would set up a kingdom in the days of the Roman king, that God would set up a kingdom and all men would flow into that kingdom and we tip back and listen to the words of Isaiah that said that the law of God and salvation would be sent forth from Zion. We find that God did exactly what he said he was going to do hundreds of years, thousands of years before. In Matthew 16, 15, we know that Jesus was there on the outskirts of Philippi when he asked the question, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And men began to say all of this fictionary uh, thinking of humanity. They were fictionary then, they're fictionary today. And when the Holy Ghost moved in Peter to say, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, uh, Jesus then picked up what Daniel left off and said, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He says, Peter, I'm going to give thee the keys uh, of the kingdom uh, of heaven. You see, the church is the kingdom, and the kingdom is the church. It was still in prophecy. It was still in the future in Matthew 16. But thank be to God, in Acts chapter 2, it came uh, into fruition. And it came into fruition because Peter preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And men whose heart was open to truth and was desirous uh, to obey God left Judaism left their father's religion, left the household religion and came to God and God knew it was going to happen. He set it up before the foundation of the world. He set it up before Genesis, before that beginning. He set it up in eternity. That's what the Bible teaches us. Peter preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Men believed. He told them to repent, every one of you, and be baptized for the remission of your sins, he said. And in doing that, in doing that, that's what they obeyed. Peter preached what God told him to preach. He preached the same thing that gospel preachers preach today. Because to become a child of God, we have to obey the same thing. And all I'm saying is that with human religion, God uh, didn't ask for any help. Amen. This is sacrilege, you see. This is going against. This is antichrist. The bottom line is antichrist. It's against God. God fixed this before he created Adam. It was over then. It's what we must understand, what we must help the world uh, out there understand. Stop hitting at leaves and branches. Just put the axe at the base of the tree. If, if there's a person who wants, to, who wants to understand and obey truth, we've got plenty of nothing but truth in the Bible that will help them. 
Peter and the apostles, they preached exactly what God told them to preach. And every individual we're going to look at this week that became covenant children of God, they obeyed the same thing. When I look at the apostle Paul, just one example. People are running around talking about their vision, their Christian experience. Nobody's vision, nobody's Christian experience exceeds that of Paul. When he was on the Damascus Road, Saul was stopped by Jesus Christ himself. The Lord stepped back into time to deal with Saul because God had a work for Saul to do. And when Saul, in that experience, fell off of his horse, donkey, whatever he was riding, got up blind. Men had to lead him to a place. When he got there for a couple of days, he sat there blind, he sat there praying, day in and day and fasting uh, and couldn't get nothing from God until a preacher arrived. God went to Ananias who was shaking in his boots. Said, Lord, hadn't you heard about, hadn't you heard about Saul? I said, man, let me just, Saul is is, is a vessel for me. It's time for him to get on straight street now. Ananias went down there and said, Saul, why tarries that? The only reason he called him brother because he was scared. He wasn't a brother in Christ. He was a brother in Judaism. He was a brother because he was a Hebrew. He said, he said, Saul, why are you tarrying? You see, Saul was trying to get something from God. But he couldn't get anything from God until the gospel got there. He was trying to get, he had been praying to get something from God, had been fasting to get something from God, had seen the vision and, and, and talked to Jesus. That wasn't made up, that's real. And he still had a sin. He still had a sin. And I said, Saul, why terrorist thou? Arrive, what? Be baptized. What? Wash, what? Washing away your sins, what? Calling on the name of the Lord. You see, you see, you see, all of this stuff, all of this stuff is nothing but man-made doctrines, and they're not really made for the Lord because he don't need man to make doctrine for him. They are made for man. Matthew 11, 12, we might hit that before the week's out. Matthew 11, 12, the Lord says uh, that, that men take the kingdom by force. That's what was happening in Jerusalem. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, all of them rejected, rejected, rejected the baptism of John. The God of heaven sent John with the baptism of repentance to prepare the hearts of men. But all the religious leaders rejected John, even got to the point where they had him beheaded, so that they could continue to do their own thing. Today, what men want to do is to do their own thing. You can't make them the kind of money they make preaching the truth. You can't have the popularity they have preaching the truth. You can't drive the cars that they drive preaching the truth. You can't live where these men live preaching the truth. You can't float in the circles where these folks uh, uh, float preaching the truth. It's not, it's not there. It wasn't designed to be there. God said, we're going to get ours on the other side. Faith said, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get there, but it's going to be on the other side. And the stuff on this side is fading away. It's rusting out. It's disappearing. But the stuff on the other side that we're going to receive is eternal and uh, everlasting. All that we want, I just want us to to at least get today is to understand that our God is not a fortune teller. He's not a soothsayer. He's not a mere person who who predicts. He doesn't have a crystal ball. But when God speaks, he's able to perform. He said, if I speak it, you can book it. It's a situation that's done. And because of that, we want to know and understand that the church of Christ The gospel of Christ 
the children of Christ, the mission of Christ, the doctrine of Christ, and the destiny of all of his children is set. It's done. It's over. And we can proclaim that to the world and never, ever have to look back. You, you, you need to know what we're going to talk to the city about. So if you're going to be ashamed of me, you might as well understand what you're going to be ashamed of right now. Because that, 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 that's the only message. That's the message from the word of God. You, 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 can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't be fearing. We got to, that, that's what it's all about. That's putting the axe at the root of the tree. Just two verses, and when I'm done, I'm sitting down and hope and pray that we'll, we'll see each other during the week. Go with me to Ephesians 3. What I'm just trying to get us to understand is that all that we've said today, there is no doubt. It's locked. It cannot be changed. The church of Christ is infallible. It's going to stand. That's why Jesus said the gates of hell should not prevent should not prevail against. The gates of hell are battling the church right now. The gates of hell battles the church every day. The gates of hell wants this message shut, shut down. If they can't shut it down, they want the children shut down. If they can't shut the children down, they want every mouth to be shut down. That's what Satan wants because this is the only hope of salvation. You see, it was because of this that Jesus was hung on the cross because he came forth preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. The Bible says in Ephesians 3, and we're going to a close here. I just want to lay this out, study this, and we're going to, we're going to really deal with, with some areas tomorrow. In Ephesians chapter 3, starting at verse 1, the Bible says, For this cause I Paul, watch him now, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, what? How that by revelation... He made known unto me the mystery. That, that's the Greek word mysterion. That that which was hidden. He says, I wrote a four in few words, whereby when you read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. God kept it to himself. He didn't let the angels know because they couldn't keep it to themselves. He didn't let the demons know. He didn't let humanity know. God kept this to himself. Watch what he says in verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That the, what is it? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partake us of his promise in Christ by the gospel. All of that comes together. We can't separate that. All of that is a part of the same plan. It's a part of the same prescription. It's the part of the same recipe for salvation. It doesn't change. Paul said in verse 7, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power, unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, watch this now, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship and the mystery which, watch this now, from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. We must know and understand that what we reveal to the community and what was revealed to us that allows us to be children of God, there was a time that it was hidden in the mind of God. God, if, if eternity, if, 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 if the beginning of the world is right here, then what we're talking about today God had, had it all done back here from eternity to eternity. What does that mean? There was never a time when that was a different plan. It was never a time. This was a plan from the very beginning. That's why God could speak of the cross. He could speak of the church. He could speak of the children. Uh, 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 Peter could say to your children and your children's children. That's why the Spirit could say in all of those who are far off because he was able, he saw that. He, 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 he caused that to happen. And finally, 
finally, finally, shake the person next to you and I tell them finally, and finally, and finally, 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 finally. In Romans 8, this is why we have Romans 8. This is why these are salvation words. I, I, I start, I've, got, I've got some lessons I, I like to do uh, that, that's called the language of salvation. When you deal with the language, this is the language of salvation, but, but language that we need to know and understand. As we close, Paul says in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. People who have been called according to the purpose of religion, human doctrines do not fit and they can't have Romans 8. Those outside of Christ cannot have Romans 8. Those that think they're saved because they believe cannot have Romans 8. Those that, 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 that did what they did outside of knowledge of the gospel and obedience to the gospel cannot have Romans 8. And that upset people, but the truth is still the truth. This was written to covenant individuals. It was written to covenant individuals. And so I ain't no use just trying to make folk feel good, lying to them. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to. You see that right there? According to what? His purpose. Watch this now. For whom he did foreknow. There we go again. He's way over here. You know, saying that I'm going to have children over there. And this is how I'm going to have children. This is how that birth is going to take place. You see, you see, that, that, that predestination was not us as individuals. That predestination was in the how God was going to allow us to be his children. You see, I know there are those out there that will teach that predestination says uh, that, that some are marked out for salvation and they're going to be saved regardless. Some are marked out for damnation. They're going to be damned regardless. That is not biblical. That is not true. That does not come from the word of God. However, predestination is true. The foreknowledge of God is a reality. That's what makes him God. He said, now, watch him now. He said, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called them, he also justified, and whom he justified them, he also glorified with God. It's already done. When, when we were baptized into Christ, as far as God is concerned, it was already done. Now, we can blow it. That's why Paul says, I don't want to preach the gospel to the world and then end up being what? A castaway. A castaway. He, he said, don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. But the possibility is there. No man have the possibility of being right with God outside of the gospel. And it, didn't, it did not start in America. It, 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 the, 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 the plan was carried out in Palestine, but it started in eternity, before there was a Palestine, before there was dirt. This plan was done. Before there was a sea, before there was a mountain, this was done. It was solid, and God did not need Boniface the third. He only did it because he, there were Christians out there that were so faithful to God until they allowed themselves to be eaten by life, allowed their families to be broken up. They were willing to give up their lands, give up their houses, not be able to have jobs because the Lord said, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you that crown of righteousness. And they did that, and those people were dying every day. And Boniface said, bye, 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 doggone it. I'll tell you what we can do. We can, we can, we can, we can just do something. We'll start our own church. We're going we're gonna to call it the Universal Church. We're going we're gonna to pick out one of the apostles, make him my first pope. We're going to lay it all, fix it up, and tell the world that this is the way to God. And then when Martin Luther looked at what he did 
and, and, and their upsettedness of all of those doctrines of humanity that were so far outside of the word of God. 97 Theses nailed on the door. But the problem is that, is that Luther didn't go far enough. You see? He got to go back to God. Luther said, says, Bonafide, you're wrong. This is how it's done. And he missed the mark. And, and men have been missing the mark ever since. It cannot be done. You can't, you can't, you can't improve on perfect. You can't make better something that's already done. And all I'm saying to the family today is that this week we have an opportunity to study the word of God. To know without a shadow of a doubt. That we're standing where all men must stand. We're proclaiming what all men must proclaim. If salvation is going to be a part of their lives. Today we need to look at ourselves. And say, and say Lord help me to see you for who you are. To understand your uniqueness, to understand your, your bigness, to, to understand your power, your, your omnipotence, your omnipresence, to, to un understand and to and to understand, Lord, that you're bigger than anything we can we can imagine. Bigger, stronger. Lord, you're all that. And I'm just glad to be your child. I pray that God will bless you. He will bless us. And that you will tell people everywhere, all around, to come and hear the message from God. We have to tell the truth. But help us. Pray for us as we deal with this. Tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock, the sovereignty of God's salvation. It's his way or no way. That's, that's, I mean, that, that's, that's, we got nothing to do with that. We just got to proclaim it the way God give it and pray that men will love themselves enough and love God enough to turn from the world and come from God because what we speak is fact because we cut the word of God straight and we must stand on that cut. May God bless you, keep you, we appreciate you for holding on, for hanging in there. We've got a massive work to do for God. We've got to run with the horsemen. We've got to stand with the biggest because we stand with the Lord. If you need him tonight, if you're hurting, if you're dealing with situations in life, whatever your needs might be, what a wonderful time to come and bring it unto God. If repentance is needful, what a wonderful time to bring it to God. If you're not a child of God and you're still steeped in the rudiments of the world, what a wonderful time to bring your life to God. Allow him to erase this, take you all the way back to the straight gate, open the gate, let you in, and you continue to walk in that narrow way before the almighty God. God bless. If you need him today, will you please come? Won't you come right now as we stand to sing? the song of encouragement. If somebody not standing, hunt